Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Muir Meredith, head of the Westmark School, an independent school that prepares students with language-based learning differences for success in college. Westmark accomplishes this through the use of the most current education pedagogy and evidence-based methodologies, through the use of multi-sensory approaches, and by leveraging the latest research and assistive technologies. Prior to joining Westmark, Meredith served various schools in top leadership roles and was previously a teacher for over 20 years. Muir has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us, and I'd like to thank you, Muir, for joining us today. Thank you, Mark. So language-based learning differences is a, is a rather tortured and long description of a, a set of uh, learning uh, attributes. Right. Could you talk a little bit about what that encapsulates? Language-based learning uh, differences really um, fall under a huge umbrella called dyslexia. And a lot of people throughout the country don't want to label it dyslexia. Um, but dyslexia is defined by Dr. Sally Shaywitz from Yale as an unexpected difference in, in reading ability compared to intellect. And if you look at, at basically a child having problems reading, uh, you can actually go back further and look at infants having problems learning how to speak. Often you find that they have a language-based learning difference later on that translates into dyslexia. And then as the child learns to read or not, then they may have problems processing the language. They also may have problems then uh, with written output. And so that's called written output disorder. It still follows, falls under the umbrella of dyslexia. However, a lot of states are quite shy about that term, and we're trying to get the term incorporated back in. Uh, it is um, a scientific term for language-based learning differences. And is it, is it um, seen to be a matter of genetic uh, predisposition? Is it an experiential? People don't completely know, uh, but for the most part, um, it is genetic. It can skip generations, but any, anybody who comes to the realization through an assessment that they are dyslexic can usually look back to a relative and find that relative was dyslexic or is still dyslexic. And adult dyslexics are still out there in large numbers. And the important uh, truth is that dyslexia does not correlate to intelligence. No, absolutely not. In fact, um, there are correlations made uh, to say that dyslexics are, on average, somewhat brighter than the general population. Uh, so certainly, no lack of intelligence. 50% of, of CEOs from major corporations are either dyslexic, ADHD, or both. And uh, it's proven true. And so if we take a look at people who are dyslexic, ADHD, that's a minority of the population, yet these leaders who are responsible for a great deal of benefit that, that accrues to society uh, come from this small population. Absolutely. It, it's in part uh, um, a lot of the theory around that, which they have not been able to prove yet, but the Shaywitzes at Yale, uh, Frank Manis, Dr. Frank Manis at USC have been doing a lot of work with functional uh, MRIs and proving where people learn to read when they're dyslexic or when they're not dyslexic. And uh, the, the standard reader, the mainstream reader, uh, will learn on the left side of the brain and they'll learn in three spots and uh, you can actually see that happening on the MRI. Whereas the, the dyslexic, on the left side of the brain you see very little activity, little activity towards the front of the brain but you see a lot of activity going on on the right side of the brain, which is the creative side. And so there's, tr people are trying to come up with why these people are so out of the box, why they're so creative, and that's part of the theory, is they, they work that side of the brain so hard, but there isn't any scientific proof for that. Um, the lack of ability um, to provide um, adequate educational support is it, is it in part a dysfunction on the part of our standard schooling approaches? Ab absolutely, and, and uh, it's very difficult to, to assign fault 
Um, but if you take an out-of-the-box thinker or a child who needs to, to learn um, visually or uh, solely visually or, or one that needs to learn uh, auditorily um, and really perhaps needs a little one-on-one -on -one or small group, how can you do that in a classroom of 35 students? Uh, it's difficult enough for the teacher to identify any child with a learning difference. Um, and really the legal term is disability, mm -hmm. um, but any dyslexic will tell you when pushed that they don't have a learning disability. They can absolutely learn incredibly well. They might have a print disability. Um, but that child in, in a classroom can get lost very quickly. Yes. And there are other children in the classrooms that have learning disabilities or differences as well that the teacher in the public school is trying to deal with. And when one in five statistically learn differently, it, it's pretty challenging for your average public school to be able to deal with that. And part of the issue right now is that with the way we fund education in particular uh, through property taxes uh, and with the issue um, hitting us all in the real estate markets, property tax revenues are decreasing. Um, with the fact that uh, school funding is being impacted by this very deep recession, um, the, the support network that might otherwise be afforded for children that require more attention is no longer there. Well, that's true. And, and this is um, adding to that. Uh, it's absolutely true with the, with the lack of funding and, and everything that you said really hits home with that, but it makes the school districts even more reticent to diagnose or to send children for diagnoses uh, because that often has monetary implications. And so teachers are, are generally discouraged, and, and that's a gentle term, they're discouraged from pointing out that a child may learn differently or uh, look for assessment for that child there is a need out there. How does the need connect with the school? And what, is the, what does the first interaction look like between uh, a parent who is uh, seeking some help and might not even know what the issue is? They just have experienced frustration and the children have experienced frustration. These very bright children have experienced frustration. Um, how, does, how, do, how do you generally connect? The connection, it's, it's uh, difficult um, through educational therapists who uh, often the child's experience and the family's experience will be frustration at school. Uh, often these children have report cards that have the word uh, lazy or a politer synonym. Um, they, they also have unmotivated uh, and then you can get into the, to the uh, uh, problem causing. Um, aspects of their behavior or they're withdrawn and they're quiet and so somebody has to identify that this child uh, has got a problem. Often the teacher sees it, often the parent sees it, they don't quite know where to turn to. Usually in Los Angeles it ends up being a parent that will go to um, a therapist, uh, will get the child assessed and then talk to the therapist about what's the match, what school should they be looking to. And so we have relationships with a lot of therapists. They know what we do. They need to find out what we do. But also out of the independent school system, many of the independent schools are less afraid to speak up. So they are actually identifying children earlier. And uh, early intervention is absolutely essential. Uh, the difference between getting our hands on a child in third grade and tenth grade is incredible because the amount of suffering and pain that the child will have gone through between third grade and tenth grade is incredible and the parents as well. Uh, there's a statistically uh, marriages break up often with children with severe learning differences. We don't really deal with severe learning differences but we dyslexia isn't in that category, it's mild. It's a very difficult journey to finally reach the conclusion where, or a point where there is clarity. Right. And so when that happens, when that 
understanding is reached. Um, what is the experience of parents? It's fantastic. Uh, when, when, when the parents first understand their child's problem and they go through a, a stage of mourning, uh, a stage of grief, and, and wondering where to turn to. Um, and what we find, and, and there's story after story that I can tell, and, and my usual line is, give us two weeks with the child and give us two months with the parent. Uh, <laughs> the child is happy and content within two weeks and um, the parents, it takes a little longer. One of my favorite lines from a little boy named Alex after he'd been at the school, he's a fifth grade boy and he's still with us. Um, after two weeks I was talking to him and I said, Alex, how are you enjoying school? He said, I love it. He said, Westmark has the oil. And I said, what do you mean by that, Alex? Westmark has the oil. And he said, well, I have gears inside my head. And in my old school, they were rusted. And Westmark has put oil in, and the gears are turning, and I'm learning again. But it's his gears. His gears. His gears. His gears. And he is a very bright young man. So a child enters, enters the school, and, and a child will enter the school in different grades. So right. there will be different experiences. But talk a little bit about the approaches that you use and how those approaches differ. I think one of the important things, if we, if we uh, look at what makes the children so happy at the school, is that we're a real school and they don't view us as therapeutic. We're, we're a real school, we have a sports program, we have arts, we have do community service, we have dances, some of them are a little small, but. Uh, dances that are actually a lot of fun. So that breaks the ice. But if we take a younger child and when they come to us, they are going to start every day doing two hours of reading, uh, reading instruction. Now, when I first heard that, I thought, that's torture. Because any dyslexic will say the hardest thing for them to do is reading. And it takes great effort and a lot of work. However, our reading classes are four to one, uh, so one teacher for four children, and they use the Linda Mood Bell approach, which is a phonics-based approach, uh, but they also visualize and verbalize, and uh, they, they play games with the language. They learn to decode, then they learn to comprehend, and then we use another program um, called Read Naturally, uh, which is a computer-based program as well, but it also doesn't have to be on the computer, which increases the child's fluency. And so we're working on their reading, decoding, and then their, their comprehension, and their fluency. And, and so really concentrating intensively, two hours, first thing in the morning, and then after that they go through a variety of other classes. But all the way through, we're using assistive technology, um, which we're really, uh, our teachers are, are really learning how these assistive, assistive technologies work because so many of them are, are developing so quickly. Um, Read and Write Gold or Kurzweil uh, are um, text-to-speech, so your computer will read to you. Um, Mac has a program as well. Uh, Mac has a program to do the opposite, as does uh, Dragon Speak. Those are just amazing. And uh, Intel has a new portable device out. It's called the Intel Reader. Hmm. So you can hold it over a uh, piece of text. Um, a young man named Ben Foss mm -hmm. invented it from San Francisco. And it will read aloud anything. So this is a portable device. If a dyslexic is in a restaurant, they can hold it over the menu. The best story that Ben tells of this was letting a young man beta test it. And he took it home and he read the rules of Risk, the board game Risk, and he determined from reading the rules that his friends had been cheating him. <laughs> now, how empowering was that to be able to say, I read the rules, right. rather than my mummy read the rules. Right. So he felt empowered. It's an amazing technology out there that will help these students. So we also, um, once, once the children get a little older, uh, and not much older, we start working on organizational skills. Because many of our students are ADHD, and if you take the history of ADHD, 
and I'm definitely ADHD. If you go back into the 60s, when I could have been diagnosed, I would not have been diagnosed. It would have been called incorrigible. And probably a lot of teachers <laughs> thought I was incorrigible. Then you move up to uh, maybe into the 90s and people were talking about hyperactive. Right. And now we know about it, ADD, attention deficit disorder, or uh, with hyperactivity with the H in there. Mm -hmm. Then you take, take that a step further, you're, you're getting into a whole new realm. And the, it centers around organization. And so we work on, on organizational skills uh, out of the uh, University of Kansas has some tremendous programs. And so they're built right in. Every child does it. We have a one binder system, a certain note taking system, and they all do it. Then we go into a functional, uh, very traditional based writing program that is called the Jane Schaefer Writing Method. And it's very, very structured. So every child does um, the same kind of thing. First, they learn to write a sentence then a paragraph, and then an essay. But they also learn how to formulate their thoughts, get them organized, and on to paper. And so often our children struggle from here to paper. And that's the, the written output disorder. This helps break that down. And uh, one of our, our main trainers and our, our main teachers has used it herself and has just uh, had her novel, first novel accepted for uh, publishing. So, you know, when when one listens to your narrative of these various techniques, it reminds me of nothing more than um, a rigorous sports training program. If we take the analogy just a little further, I think I think it's a great uh, uh, a great metaphor for for how we we function. But uh, if you if you take it in terms of football or in terms of basketball, you look at the player and you say, now you're going to be a quarterback or a point guard or a center based on their skills and abilities. So if we translate skills and abilities into learning styles, learning ways of learning, then we know that this child needs this and uh, that, that, that they really flourish if they can do this. One of our teachers did a, a great um, uh, project and this is uh, it's called differentiated instruction so you you make sure that you find out how each child learns and you differentiate your lesson to them but you also allow them to differentiate he wanted to teach he was teaching history and he wanted them to understand uh, how things were happening uh, a few hundred years ago in Maryland with religion and this young young boy he decided to do it through art and he painted a picture and the picture is a watercolor and it's beautiful. We have it framed. And, but the really brilliant thing was to then hear him articulate exactly what was going on in Maryland as he looked at his, his artwork on the wall. And it's, it, it, it's beautiful. It's yeah. a beautiful, beautiful piece. Yeah, yeah. He's, he was very proud. So y you have all these different techniques. Some of them are assisted by technology. Yes. Um, it, it reminds me of the, uh, of the very real fact that um, had I been born a few hundred years earlier, um, I who have very, very poor vision and had very poor vision from mm -hmm. a very early age, my life would have been completely different. And um, I might not have gotten to this age. Absolutely. Uh, simply because I couldn't work at a certain point, I couldn't particularly function. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are so many people like me uh, technology does make a difference uh, to people's lives. Um, how do you interact with the suppliers of these technologies? Because these technologies are not cheap, they're not free. No, they're not. And uh, we, we are constantly wor working with uh, people and uh, foundations and, and trying to raise money for technology. Um, our, our, our parents stepped up uh, two years ago at our 25th anniversary and said, really if you're going to have our, our children using technology and we're going to advance technologically in the school every teacher needs a laptop and so people at the gala made sure that every teacher had a laptop and we do professional development uh, is a big part because our teachers um, have to have all the credentials to teach 
math or to teach English, the uh, bachelor's degrees, the master's degrees, they're very well qualified people. But then they have to have their Westmark toolkit. Right. And the Westmark toolkit will include Linda Mood Bell or the Jane Schaefer writing or the Sims out of Kansas University. Um, and they have to be technologically sound. We're, we're using uh, a lot of smart boards now, uh, interactive boards, and so they not only have to know how to do, use their laptop effectively, they're now learning the smart boards as well. And then you add the assistive technology onto the, the laptop and onto um, the smart board uh, to do one of these read and write gold uh, exercises, which will read any text. Do that on a smart board and have the children interacting with it. It's brilliant. And, and there is a huge amount of professional development that's required because these technologies are evolving so rapidly. And very often the parents need to be brought on board in terms of how these technologies work and how the parents might have a role yes. in, in, in applying those technologies. Yes, absolutely. And, and we do, um, I think that's another key factor is parent education. Is uh, because really in any school, in any setting, when it works best for a child, you have three groups, the child, the parents, and the school, preferably the teachers. Uh, you often don't need administrators. You just need the teachers who are interacting. And if, if you've got teamwork between all three, right. the child succeeds. Now, Westmark didn't just um, spring into being um, uh, out of whole cloth uh, two weeks ago. No. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the genesis of the school, its origins, mm -hmm. uh, its founding, and its various transformations through the years? Yes. Westmark is an interesting school. It, it began as Landmark West. And Landmark is probably one of the most famous schools that's dealt with dyslexics for uh, 80 years plus. Uh, and it's from Beverly, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And uh, Charles Drake was involved in, in founding uh, this methodology out of Landmark. Uh, coincidentally, at about the same time, about 28 years ago, there were two other Landmarks formed. Uh, one was a franchise, and it was in Nova Scotia, Canada, and the other was Landmark West in Culver City, Los Angeles. It, it began because there was a group of parents out here that said, we're tired of sending our children all the way across the country to get educated. We want what they have out here. And so it began, and it began with some very interesting people um, who were really passionate. And they got it going, um, but with, with that kind of passion also comes leadership. And uh, these people were somewhat frustrated with um, having a parent company, if you like, back in Boston, Massachusetts. And so they wanted to run things themselves and they moved the campus from Culver City to Encino. Our current location was a, uh, a little uh, public elementary school, about five acres, a gorgeous piece of property, and uh, they separated. And uh, they, there was some acrimony between the two groups. That, that's all finished now. Uh, the head of Landmark and I get along very well, and we're cooperating on a lot of fronts. Um, they do do things somewhat differently than we do, and that's part of the, the genesis. Over, over the time, though, um, one of the things that happened in L.A. that was fascinating to me is that if a child could not be educated in the local public school, then the parents had the ability to um, get their child funded, and they could be funded and placed into a school like Westmark and they were more readily placed into the school like Westmark if Westmark classified itself as a non-public school and not completely an independent school. It meant that, that the local school districts would hold some strings. Um, and one of the most interesting and I think ironic strings that they held was they demanded that we use their textbooks. Well, textbooks <laughs> for dyslexic students that are for mainstream students didn't make sense. And over, over time, our board very courageously about five years ago said we're not going to take the funded students under that circumstance and but we will not ask funded students to leave we'll phase this out and so they phased it out and and we went from about 80 fee, fee paying students 
now to just under 200 fee-paying students. Some of our students, though, that are paying fees are still funded, but they do that privately with the school division that they're from and with the full understanding that they get the fees from the school division and they pay us, therefore no strings, which made us a wholly independent school, which we celebrated, and I mean celebrated, about 15 months ago, but who's counting? Um, and that allowed us not only to be a member of the National Association of Independent Schools, but we're also a candidate school for the California Association of Independent Schools, which does a very thorough inspection of us next year. And you don't have to use textbooks that are inappropriate we for can use the what, challenges that your yes, children... We can use whatever material we want to use, and we choose some absolutely exciting material. And the organization has gone through substantial changes over that period yes. of time. Yes. The campus has expanded substantially, and you're, you're yes. uh, continuing that expansion. You've brought in new technologies. You've brought in new teacher training. What are you not changing? Um, some of the teachers. <laughs> some of the teachers are absolutely fabulous. And uh, they're dedicated. Uh, they're hardworking. And they're very enthusiastic. And, and they're enthusiastic and caring. Um, Extremely, and but we are we are transforming the campus. We've built two new buildings, uh, so we've taken buildings down. Uh, one of them, uh, one of the buildings, as I came on on stream, we had a brand new parent to the school, uh, two weeks into the school year, donate a million dollars mm. towards building uh, a new building. This year, we had another brand new parent to the school. Um, donated $750,000 towards the next new building, which we'll pull a permit for in, uh, in June. Um, and why do these people do this? And it's a bit going back to what you were, you were saying. They found the place that their ch child needs to be. And they've done their research, they've done their homework, and they see the need for better facilities, so they're stepping up. And they're building for the future. Yes. They're building for the next generation of students. Yes. One, one of the parents, and, and he wants to remain anonymous, the one who gave a million dollars, um, ha has recently himself come out of the closet and admitted that he's dyslexic, and his son is dyslexic, and uh, so he's looking forward. Um, there's a, a wonderful movie that was made by one of our parents, uh, Kathleen Kennedy, who was, is probably one of LA's most famous producers, uh, but she made the movie for Yale about dyslexics. And uh, when you see the variety of people uh, who are dyslexic and are brilliant, um, and they are all thirsting for the right education. And, and uh, in talking to a variety of people, it's how we take Westmark and what we're doing at Westmark and get it out into the rest of the world. And that's one of our missions, too. Well, many of the most brilliant people that we work with, uh, who sit on boards and who lead nonprofits, um, have minds that work in fundamentally different ways mm -hmm. than my more conventional mind uh, works. And it is just wondrous sometimes to see how they think, to experience that, and to benefit from it. And uh, it's, it's just wonderful that this school is here to cultivate those children, to cultivate that thinking for our society uh, to the benefit of us all. Um, I'd like to thank you, Muir, for sharing your insights with us today, and thank you for spending time building this wonderful school. Oh, my pleasure. It is my pleasure. Thank you for your insights. Yeah, thanks.